Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, show number 40, where we interview Joe Saul Cihai from Stack and Benjamins. It's time for a new American dream, one that doesn't involve working in a cubicle for 40 years, barely scraping by. Whether you're looking to get your financial house in order, invest the money you already have, or discover new paths for wealth creation, you're in the right place. This show is for anyone who has money or wants more. This is the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. How's it going, everybody? I'm Scott Trench. I'm here with my co-host, Miss Mindy Jensen. How are you doing today, Mindy? I'm doing great, Scott. How are you today? I am doing fantastic. I'm very excited to interview Joe, who has got a just incredible charisma and energy about him, and uh, host of host of the Stacking Benjamins podcast, and uh, over there at stackingbenjamins.com, which is one of my favorite podcasts, and just like a really fun time with a lot of insider jokes that is kind of an addicting, addicting personality and show. So, yes, I love Stacking Benjamins. Um, I listen to this show when I'm working around the house most. Typically, when we're cleaning up the basement or cleaning out the garage, um, usually cleaning out the garage. I don't know why my garage gets so much crap in it. Um, so we throw on a couple of episodes of Stacking Benjamins as we're cleaning up. And it's just, it's kind of interesting to have this guy on my show that I listen to all the time. His ear, his voice is always in my head. And then here I get to talk to him. So yes, I am very excited. Um, he's not usually telling all about his life. So this was a really fun episode to record. Yeah. I, I, and I, uh, he's also got a brilliance about financial management that, uh, and, and a story that I actually hadn't heard before. I've listened to some of his podcasts, not all of them, but, uh, I really enjoy his show, but I had never heard his personal story before. So I was really, really excited, uh, and grateful to hear that. And he's got a very awesome set of experiences that are really applicable to a lot of people. Yeah. And I mean, I can't believe that, Somebody who is a certified financial planner made money mistakes. They should be perfect, right? And it's kind of refreshing, I would think, for somebody who is in this position of debt or, you know, hasn't reached financial independence yet to hear from somebody, you know, we've done this a couple of times on the show where we hear from somebody who is supposed to be a money expert, but they also made mistakes in the past. So, you know, don't beat yourself up because you have a less than perfect financial situation. Just take the information and apply it to your own self. Love it. Well, should we bring him in? Let's bring in Joe. Joe Saul Cihai, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. How are you doing today? Am I really here? You're really here. You finally made it. You're finally <laughs> a big enough deal to be on our show. <laughs> this is uh, a life's dream. I'd like to thank all the little people who helped me get here. Uh, <laughs> That's oh, me. Fantastic. If I start sweating <laughs> profusely uh, in here in the uh, presence of greatness, just just uh, call me down. <laughs> I will. I will call you out. I will say this before we start. Uh, uh, so Scott was nice enough to autograph a couple copies of his awesome book for my kids. And I have to, to tell you, Scott, on the show here, that that book has already at the beginning of my kids' career changed both of their lives. Just great, absolute oh. stuff. My, 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 my daughter is uh, doing very well in Kansas City, um, but my son, who's in Seattle at Microsoft, is like totally on the, how do I bike to work every day? Let's make sure I have a place close next to uh, next to work. Like I'm like, is this my son Nick or am I talking to Scott Trench? So, <laughs> so sorry. you have a mini me in Seattle. I'm sorry, what is that book, Joe? Uh, I think it's called Set for Life. It's a fantastic read. You should read it, Mindy. I actually have. I read it before you and before your kids. Um, it didn't change my life just because I already embody like pretty much all of it. But yeah, if I had been starting out, that would have been awesome. That is my go-to book to give everybody for graduations and weddings and all that stuff. That is my go-to present. So yeah, Scott, thanks for being awesome. Well, guys, I really appreciate the plugs. I'm just glad your 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 son or your daughter like the book and are applying it. That's awesome. 
Yeah, no, it is. It is really cool to see them because you know how important it is. And for anybody listening, starting out to, to start out on the right foot, to build those habits early. I mean, some of the biggest things people do when they first start out is they decide very quickly how to get into debt. I used to talk a lot at high schools and it was funny. But they'd have these question and answer sessions and every single question was a variant on how the hell do I get myself screwed by the time I'm 21? Right? How, how do I make sure that my life is just climbing? out of a pit by the time I'm getting a decent wage? How do I get a car loan? How do I get a, 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 my as big a mortgage as possible? How do I get the best credit card with the highest interest rate that I can get? Like all these horrible things. I'm like, no guys, let's talk about building wealth. No, no, no. Let's talk about how I get better rims on my truck. That's what I want. <laughs> you yeah. need free wealth. Are those yeah, even yeah. still a thing? I, no idea. I'm a <laughs> members only jacket kind of guy. And so, yeah. <laughs> Duran Duran, right? That's that's uh, dates me slightly. Yeah, but I think I think it's great. This is like the, a key point, a key leverage point in your life where you can really begin applying these things with a clean slate is right after you graduate college. So in high school, in college, getting access to any information about how to just build wealth appropriately, I think is a, is a, is a big advantage. Like my advantage was I graduated college debt free, and then I was able to start from scratch, learning from. Mr. Money Mustache, learning from Joe, learning from all these other resources and not have to make any mistakes or any big mistakes really on the path towards accumulating those first assets. Well, you know, Scott, if you learn anything from me, you're supposed to keep it to yourself. So let's <laughs> let's start there. But, but you ruin my reputation, dude. But, but I'm a guy who uh, did things exactly the opposite of you, Scott. I mean, I messed up everything. I came from a family where we never talked about money. Every time that my parents were having a money conversation, I'd get sent out of the room. My, my brother, my sister, and I would immediately be sent out of the room. We, uh, When I got to college, I immediately went to the uh, that little table that they have where they're giving away credit cards, and I signed up for an American Express card, which is funny because for, uh, for nine years, I became a spokesperson later for American Express. Uh, they, they apparently hadn't checked my credit in the fact that my first credit card in college I had taken away at the three month mark because I didn't realize that you had to actually pay that bill after you took everybody to lunch. Like I took all my friends to lunch because I had this awesome little green card. I bought a sweater. I was at a military college, the Citadel, the military college of South Carolina. I don't know if you know this, but in military college, you wear uniforms. That's number one. Number two is you can't have a job. So why the hell am I applying for a credit card where I can't pay the bill? And then number two, wh why do I need a sweater? Like, why am I buying an expensive sweater from a department store? And uh, 90 days later, my my credit's ruined. I'm in collections and I had to climb out. So I'm a guy that started off my life making a ton of bad assumptions uh, about life, about money, about, um, about everything. And, you know, part of that, by the way, guys, is – I also come from a family where my parents did talk about money. We always talked about payments. I grew up like most Americans in a payment lifestyle. How much can we afford to finance? And my, don't get me wrong. My parents are great people. They, they just didn't really know money. They knew hard work. They knew how to get along with other people. But when it came to cash, they're like most people. We went to the car dealer. We bought cars new. Uh, the car dealer would talk about what can you afford? And he wasn't talking about how much money, you know, can you afford $20,000 or $10,000? He was talking about, well, I can afford $350 a month. And we lived that lifestyle growing up. And that's where I came from, like most people, and had to dig my way out. Okay. I thought you were a smart guy who's great with money. Why are we talking to you? I know. <laughs> Bye, Joe. Well, the cool thing is, I did figure it out. I did figure it out. And not only did I figure it out, I figured it out the hard way, like most people end up uh, having to figure it out. And you guys have had great people on your show who have talked about this before, about making big mistakes in their life and finally getting to the point where I remember I'm on the side of the road because my car's run out of gas. I'm a mile from a gas station. I'm driving a Ford Aerostar that has about 140,000 miles on it because it was all I could afford at the time. Um, and I'm going through the seats trying to scrounge up money in between the seats so that I could walk down to the gas station and put a dollar of gas in that hopefully would be enough to get me home. And I remember in that moment saying to myself, I can't do this. Like, how are other people doing things so much better than I am? How, how are they getting ahead? And I, I then went home and uh, began looking at 
finance books, began looking at people on TV. I remember watching the Today Show and watching these people on TV that that knew about clipping coupons and all these cool, hey, if you put these two things together, and I thought that was just magic. And then I found out that you could become a financial advisor. So here I am, a guy who's not good with money, who's had serious money issues. I apply to be a financial advisor. And of course, by the way, I got hired. <laughs> <laughs> I got hired to teach other people about money. But but the funny thing was, I'm already at that point pulling myself out. And then I started being around a bunch of people uh, who were good with money. You know, my clients were people that that had some great habits and me having to show them the mirror of how to do their money better. Uh, I then had to be better with my own cash as well. And so not only did I pull myself out of that bad one, Mindy, um, I I also learned how to I don't know, kind of hack your way to wealth. What was your lifestyle like and what were you working? What was your job prior to that kind of uh, like revelation moment in the car when you ran out of gas? So I was working two jobs. I was working in telemarketing, which, by the way, is a glamorous career. I was calling up <laughs> I was calling up people for a company called Wolverine Water, uh, where we're selling water treatment systems. And we're giving them, Scott, I'd call you and I'd say, hey, my name's Joe, and we're in your area doing free water tests. Would you like one of our technicians to stop by and do a free water test? And, of course, what they're going to do is do a dog and pony show where they sell you uh, – reverse osmosis uh, water system for all you water geeks out there. You know what that is. Uh, maybe a water softener. We, we'd hook you up, Scott. It was great. Nice. Does it taste really good? <laughs> was, the, the reverse osmosis stuff did. If you had water softened water, it's horrible. And uh, how much was this uh, amazing system? Uh, you know, it's funny. I didn't sell it. I just set the, I just set the test. So I have no idea. I believe. Bucks? No, I believe it was um, $10,000. For this system, maybe back when you were selling it, it was twenty five hundred. But yeah. when I was looking at it, when they accosted me at Home Depot, they're like, "Hey, how would you like to have great tasting water?" I'm like, "Well, who wouldn't?" So I go there, or I have them come over, and they're like, "Oh yeah, that'll be ten thousand dollars." I'm like, "American dollars? Because no, I'll do ten thousand lira." Do you remember? I'm really dating myself. Joe and I are going to date ourselves this whole show. And I'll Scott's going to be before, like, what's that? that? Euro. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do, I'll, I'll do 10,000 rubles. <laughs> Rupees. <What's that>? $18. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, but 10,000 American dollars, I am not putting a water system in my house. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. We're getting off track. So, what, what, what was your other job? So you had two jobs. You had telemarketing and then you had. I did. And at night, I was a, I was a bar DJ. I did bar part. I did. Uh, I worked in bars. I worked at parties. I did college fraternity parties on weekends. I did weddings. I was the guy out leading the chicken dance and the hokey pokey, doing all that fun stuff. That Have actually you- was interesting too, because that was my first. The thing that really saved me was learning how to run a business, um, and I learned how to run a business the hard way too. And I really, when 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 I got to that point where I just couldn't do things. The same way I was doing it, I uh, and I started reading finance books. One of the early books that 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 I that I turned to um, was all about uh, PR and all about marketing and all about running running a successful business. Um, and and that book, Guerrilla Marketing. Guerrilla Marketing. All right. Guerrilla. Guerrilla like G U E. Guerrilla. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Guerrilla marketing was fantastic. And from there, then I started writing just basic business finance books, like like business for dummies and and uh, how to run a successful business. And I was hoping to franchise that business. I ended up instead uh, selling that business as my financial planning career was starting up and taking off and doing fun things there. What, What was your spending like? leading up to this point? Like, what were you, 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 I mean, you're obviously, you know, spending all all the money that came in, but what was that going to? Do you have any idea? No, no, absolutely not. (laughs) Cause I didn't track anything. I mean, it's funny to know where you're going. You have to know where you've been. I had no idea where I, where I had been. Um, and it was funny, one of the first personal finance books that, that, that I read, and I don't even remember what it was, but but it talked about that, about actually t- t- taking a pad of paper with you when you went. Of course, this is the mid 90s. So uh, t- taking a pad of paper with you and just writing down how you spend money. And as you spend it, if you have to write it down and you have to look at it, you might not spend as much. And that was one of the first hacks, actually in becoming more successful with money was that I never wanted to write down the crap I was 
was buying because <laughs> I was buying computer games. I'm buying uh, tons of CDs, you know, and not for my business. I'm buying tons of CDs because I'm a big fan of music. So I'm buying uh, I'm buying that. I'm buying DVDs. Uh, it's funny Then later on, I discovered that the library had a bunch of the DVDs that I wanted and cut that out of my budget, too. But it all started off with going from not knowing anything. Like I seriously, when you ask that question, Scott, I'm like, I have no idea where all that money went. Zero. Uh, uh, but it didn't go anywhere good. Let's put it that way. And general rule of thumb is when you're scrounging in the seats of your uh, late model Ford Aerostar minivan to find a dollar, you probably haven't spent the money before that in a good way. <laughs> Well, the reason I'm asking that is what, what was your, what, what are you kind of changes did you notice in your lifestyle in terms of how you enjoyed yourself after you kind of had this, this revelation moment and began, you know, learning about financial independence, starting to track your spending a little bit, that kind of stuff. For the first time in my life, I actually felt like I was in charge. It's, it's funny because I thought that spending more money equaled having more fun, equaled living your life better. And that's not, that didn't end up being true at all. I mean, at the time I had just gotten married and we did our whole honeymoon on, on credit cards. Um, and I remember coming back from our honeymoon and feeling absolutely horrible. And when we stopped living a debt lifestyle and instead started making sure that we had a fund of money to go on our vacation ahead of time, uh, when we took a, we took a trip, uh, the next year to, um, uh, to Colorado, uh, to Denver. And we went out West to Rocky mountain national park. Um, when we took that trip, that was all cash. And I remember for the first time in my life, I felt completely relaxed on a vacation because I wasn't worried about where the money was going to come from to pay for it. When I got home, um, I remember after my honeymoon, just Cheryl and I both just feeling horrible, like, man, we, we thought we were having a good time, but now for the next several months or in our case, it, it took a couple of years. Uh, we had to pay all that stuff off, all that fun that we had. Wow. And paying it off over a couple of years is kind of soul crushing. you like, I went on this trip. I don't even remember it now. It was so long ago. And right. yet I'm still writing out that check for $27 and 32 cents for the minimum payment on the credit card. Financing that hamburger at 21%. <laughs> Always a good choice. <laughs> Fantastic choice. Yeah. What um what was the when was like the first time you kind of had a real understanding of your overall financial position? I think along the I think are you talking about like exactly where I was? Yeah. I think it's I think it's when I was scrounging uh, for, for money uh, <laughs> there. Like I knew I was completely screwed. And then when, when I started reading financial books and they talked about writing down, writing down, uh, everything, you know, I mean, and so I spent 16 years as a financial planner after this. And what I learned was that you can't diagnose your, what's wrong with you, the sickness until you have it all out in front of you. And it's funny because a lot of people I think are living the same life that I was living, which is if I don't look at it, maybe it'll get better, right? <laughs> if I just look a different way, this problem will take care of itself. And that, that, that never works. So instead, when I wrote down exactly where the debt was, what the interest rate was, not what my minimum payment was, but how much in total I had to pay to every single thing to get out of that debt, and then, by the way, uh, 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 also figure out not just that, but how do I start saving so that because saving ultimately, I kept being told over and over and over that saving was going to be was going to be the most powerful piece of this. Getting out of debt is one thing, but I saw people when I was a financial planner, I saw people that would get completely out of debt and then because they had no savings, they then get right back into debt because – if they had no cash reserve and your mufflers dragging behind your car, where do you got to go for money? So you go immediately back to back to the credit card. And you'd say, I'd meet people that would do this like I did for a long time, but even longer. People would do this for 20, 25 years. Just get out of debt, back in debt, out of debt, in debt, out of debt, in debt. So paying the debt off a little more slowly and putting some money above the line and saving was a was a big key for me to actually get a foothold and finally be able to not just pay off the debt, but to be able to pay it off for good. Okay. So how did you go from scrounging in there? Like, how did you change your mindset? Because it's one thing to say, wow, I really hate looking for quarters in the seat of the car to actually not having to look for 
quarters in the seat of the car. Did you have a conversation with Cheryl? Was she on board immediately? Did you have to convince her? Like, how did this shift happen? Because it's a no, big she, shift. Yeah, she was on board immediately. But I'll tell you, we hit a bunch of walls, Mindy. I mean, like anyone, um, we didn't get it right at first. And I think the one thing that we did well was when a uh, strategy didn't work or something didn't work, we modified it. So I'll give you an example of one thing that's really worked well for us, but it's because we play tested it for the past 25 years. And that is uh, uh, we now have a weekly money meeting. You know, we we, we use Clarity Money to, to track our expenses now. Um, at our money meeting, it's usually over wine. Uh, sometimes we'll go out for breakfast, uh, on a, on a Saturday morning and we'll, we'll talk over breakfast. Usually by the way, because it's weekly, we found it's better if it's short. So a 15 minute meeting for us is fantastic. If it's a 30, 40 minute meeting, we don't want to do it the next week. So if we keep it short, keep it fun. It's great. We walk through all of our expenses and clarity money. We walk through all of our, uh, where money's coming in the, the next week. We also look at any upcoming expenses we have, and then we look at our investments. And usually with our investments, we make no move. We usually make moves with investments two times per year, unless there's some big time extenuating circumstance or there's some opportunity that's presented itself between those six month marks. Um, we tried not to mess with the investment strategy because I think too many people get emotional uh, and make emotional moves with their investment strategy. Um, th that came about because of the fact that, you know, either I'd come home with some stupid thing or Cheryl would come home with something totally responsible like school clothes for our twins. And, and the other one would have no idea that we were spending the money. And it's funny because the fight started not because we weren't tracking money. It was because we weren't communicating. And so between clarity money or a spreadsheet or tiller or whatever you use to track your expenses and communication, I'll take communication any day. I'll tell you that our, our, our working together as a team is much better because of that meeting, not because of the fact that we know where our pennies go. Okay. Now I – I think this is super important and I want to reiterate and highlight this money meeting that you have. You have a weekly one. I can't remember if the Frugal Woods have a weekly or a monthly meeting. I know Rosemary Groner has a weekly money meeting with her husband and just, you know, hiding from your debt, ignoring your debt doesn't pay it off. Uh, oh, spoiler alert. That doesn't work. So, you know, having this money meeting and I'm, I'm you know, we're interviewing all of these successful with money people and they all say the same thing. I use a spreadsheet. I track my spending. I talk about it with my spouse. What's the number one thing people fight about in, with their spouse? They fight about money. You know how much fun it is to fight with your spouse? Zero percent. Scott, yeah. should you ever get married, fighting with your spouse is the least fun thing you'll do. Besides maybe like a root canal with no Novocaine. Um, but it's not fun at all. It just hurts your whole day, your whole experience in life for however long you're fighting. So don't fight about money. Talk about money. And yeah, if there's a problem, okay, you know what? There's a problem. Let's fix it. Let's work on it. Let's talk about our money. Let's have these weekly meetings. Let's review. Oh, look, I made a mistake this week. Okay, well, let's fix it next week. It's like dieting. You know, yeah, yeah. you didn't get fat overnight. You're not going to lose weight overnight. You didn't get in debt overnight, most likely. Um, you're not going to get out of debt overnight and you're going to make mistakes in your diet because somebody brings in chocolate cake to work that's really, really good. And you're going to make mistakes in your budget because there's really cute shoes that you just can't not have. And then you get back on track again. And, you know, beating yourself up doesn't matter. But having. Well, I was just going <laughs> to say really cute shoes is the thing that always kills my budget. I know. Yeah, that's why I said too. it. <laughs> generally, generally get killed there. But, 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 you know, you make you make a lot of great points there, Mindy. But one that that I'd like to emphasize is that and I think it was Tony Robbins. I heard say this. He said, when you hear a guru say something, you know, listen to it. It's OK. But when you hear several people and I wouldn't call myself a guru, but I certainly I've helped maybe, I don't know, uh, 150 to 200 families retire over my career. So I've seen people get to the the finish line. I've, I've probably, you know, helped another 150 to 200 put kids through college. So I've seen what most people will see once in their life. I've seen it over and over again. But Tony Robbins says that if you hear one guru say something, it might be neat. But if you hear several people say the same thing, you've, you've happened upon a truth. 
and and finding that truth and embracing it is is a big thing. I'll tell you the other thing that really helped me back to that original question you asked, which has been pack hunting. It is who you surround yourself with uh, and the voices that are in your head, you know, and I'm going to use a non-finance analogy. When we moved to Texas 10 years ago, I had no desire to run a marathon. Like I had zero plan to run a marathon. So my wife um, got hooked up. Cheryl got hooked up with this cool running group and she was running with them and they were all marathoners. And so one day she asked me if I want to come run with them. I said, sure. And they were running, I think, 10 miles. And the most I had run at the time before that had been now I, I ran in college, but I had grown lazy and fat. Uh, so w- when I say the most I'd run is 10 miles, this is the adult Joe, not the kid in college that was really fast and, and a lot thinner. Um, it's, 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 so I hadn't run that far. Um, and we went out to run the 10. They did this run walk thing where you run for seven minutes, then you walk for a minute, then you run for seven minutes and walk for a minute. And I found that I could run much longer lengths because of the fact that I was running this. And then I could also run longer lengths because I'm running with a pack of 20 people. And we're talking about movies. We're talking about what we're doing that weekend. And guess what? I went from not caring about running a marathon to running 13 marathons in the last 10 years. And I love it. And it's complete. It's it's change. I'm I'm thinner now. I'm healthier now. But I find that's that's the way it is with money. If you hang out with people who are successful with money, um, you have a much much higher aptitude with money than if you're hanging out with people who, you know, spend a ton of money. They're out partying, blowing all their cash. It's so much easier to spend a lot of money when everybody else is too. Sure. Ha- How do you go about doing that? How do you go about surrounding yourself with people who care about money? Good question. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a great question. I think, I think the first thing is, is just examine your current friends and how they work with, how they, how they work with cash. Are these people building you up or are they, are they knocking you down? I remember we talked to, and I think, well, you guys have talked to, to coach Carson before to Chad Carson. I love what I love what Chad did, which is that he started uh, uh, hanging out with people in the real estate space uh, for his niche. He's a big real estate guy for people that don't know Coach Carson. Um, He started hanging out with people that did what he wanted to do. So if I want to run marathons, I go hang out with people who run marathons. If I want to be better with money, then I join groups of people who are great with money. And I think that you can find those groups online. Of course, there's a bunch of close Facebook groups. I mean, there's groups like Bigger Pockets, as an example. We have a Facebook group at Stacking Benjamins that's always, you know, between telling bad dad jokes and talking money. It's it's a lot of fun there. But but there's there's all kinds of great places to uh, fill your head with that. And then I think, you know, you can't you can't. Um, you can't underplay just the surround sound of, uh, of, um, podcasts and audiobooks. I, mean, I find that, uh, that just keeping that in, in my head, uh, is a, is a fantastic place to start. And I end up then seeking out people that seek out that, that same type of, same type of stuff. Um, I, I love that you mentioned that the, the audio audio books and podcast t- concept because I think that that is you know you, it seems like when I was, was starting out like house hacking is this very outlandish concept that friends and family just don't understand but because it's reinforced all the time in the read the stuff I'm reading the stuff I'm listening to the the and and just all these other general concepts are being constantly reinforced I'm not the odd guy out anymore I'm surrounded by people even though they're not really there that are, that I'm kind of relating to on the other side of things. What I think was really hard for me in my like early to mid twenties, I guess I'm now in my late twenties, uh, is, is the concept of just like finding new friends. That that doesn't seem like an approachable subject. I think to, uh, a lot of people that are maybe like now that I'm a real adult, you know, a lot later, getting a little later on, it's, it's more, okay, I can make new friends and have new, and these new things, but that doesn't seem as approachable. I think to a lot of maybe younger listeners, is that, is that something that you would agree with? Is that, I mean, is that a challenge that maybe diminishes over time? No, it gets harder. I think it gets, it, I think it gets mm-hmm. harder. I was reading a statistic, uh, just literally this morning that, um, 50 year old men 
have a hell of a time finding friends. And that's a super lonely age for, for most, uh, for, for most men, uh, mm-hmm. because, you know, a guy going out and trying to find new buddies at age 50 is, uh, you know, I walk down the street, go, Hey, you want to be my buddy? It just seems a little strange. Steve's- I'd be your buddy. <laughs> <laughs> you already are my buddy. Uh, yeah. Would you be his buddy if he walked up to you on the street and said, Hey, can we be friends? <laughs> You don't right. look like a total creeper at all, uh, Joe. I, I've I've made a couple of friends in like in a similar type way. I don't think you can start out. I, yeah, I get you though. I, yeah, I get no. The point and is take it. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot easier to make friends when you're doing something in common, you yes. know. And that's pretty much as soon as you're out of college, even at Scott's tender age. Um, it, it's more difficult as you get older. I make friends now through these FI meetups that I go to, through real estate meetups that I go to, and we bond around a common, uh, you know, topic. And I make friends with the moms at school as I'm dropping off the kids, um, uh, because we're bonding around a common topic. But yeah, you can't just walk up to somebody and say, Hey, you want to be friends? It's tough. That's where, that's where the shared interest piece comes in, Mindy. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm totally with you. You can't go in looking for new friends. I think you have to go in looking for people that share the values and share the, um, uh, the interests that you have. And, and I think you do have to though, take a long look at your existing friends. Cause I think you can divorce existing friends. I think going out and, and searching just for new buddies is tough. Searching for um, groups, though, that share your values, I think, is is way easier. Uh, and divorcing yourself from old friends is a difficult thing to do. I've had to do that with people before where they're just toxic. I just can't. We have these people in our lives. I had a great mentor. Um, and we can talk about mentors, too, because that's this that's kind of a great side topic on this same same thing, same vein we're we're mining right now. But I had a great mentor who told me to stay away from clusters of misery. You know, there are groups of people who are just clusters of misery. They just complain about everything. They 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 always talk about how something somebody else's fault and instead uh, grab on to people who are living life as if they're the ones grabbing the bull by the horns. Yeah, that's a really, really, really great piece of advice. Because I'm like, as you're saying that, I'm thinking to myself, yep, that person's out, that person's out. Like, I'm I'm thinking of the people that I no longer talk to. And it just, it ruins your whole day to talk to them. Yeah. Life's too short. But yeah, the, you know, the Facebook groups are a really great place to start. You know, in real life, nobody talks about money. So you don't want to go up to somebody and, hey, are you a frugal person? Who's going to say, no way, I'm not frugal, you know, but you might find that they are. There's a lot of people who think they're frugal and they really aren't. But these Facebook groups, you can find a lot of local groups. You can find just in general groups. And then you start talking and they're like, oh, I'm the next town over from you. Oh, wow. Would you ever like to get coffee? I mean, there's I've met a lot of people who just happen to be traveling around my town or near my town that that reach out and say, hey, let's connect. Yeah, it, it seems like we're pointing to a, a combination of things to do. One, surround yourself with content, written, audio, whatever, that kind of fills fills your head in with these concepts. Two, meet groups of people in real life that can help you do this. Three, maybe get a mentor or somebody who can walk you through it that's kind of like a moral coaching setting where you are the apprentice. And 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 why not do all of these things? I, I actually did all of these things when I was kind of getting started down the journey towards financial independence. And it sounds like that's a, a similar experience for you, Joe. Yeah, it, it totally is a similar experience for me, Scott. I I figured out early on that I was it was going to take good coaches because, as I mentioned, my parents great people, but they didn't know anything about money. So I had to find people that were great at money, people that were also great at uh, building businesses because I've built and sold three different businesses. Um, but, but I didn't know any of those tools. Like I didn't know how to do any of that stuff. And so having, having somebody who's been through that before is fantastic. And, and I always get sad when I read in an online forum, somebody that says, and let's just take investing as, as an example said, well, you know what? You don't need to talk to anybody else. You should just invest your own money and do your things just, just by yourself in a silo. The frustration I, I had with that was I worked with some of the most successful people um, in the metro Detroit area when I was a financial planner. And and whenever I met super successful people, they all had great coaches around them. And I'm not saying hire a financial advisor. I'm saying have smart people around you that look at 
stuff with you. Um, and especially people that think differently than you do around you. Usually my, my smartest and just the most brilliant people that I met had these had these people around them who always seemed to be so different than they were that uh, I started modeling that. And I found my career grew much quicker. I found that my wealth grew quicker after that. I'll give you an example. I've, I've had the same life coach now for, um, over 15 years. Um, my wife doesn't like her like personally can't stand her because I tend to look at the world very optimistically. I run into walls at a hundred miles an hour. Mary Lou, my, my coach looks at the world very negatively, looks at things as if I need to be much, much more careful than I am. Like she is exactly the opposite of me. And that's the reason I hire her isn't to be my buddy. I don't need a buddy. I need somebody who can cover my blind side. And Mary Lou's been fantastic for me at doing that. And by the way, Mary Lou, if you're listening to this, uh, we, we love you. It just, (laughs) 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 we think, we, we, we think you're great, but, uh, but just socially, you know, Mary, Mary, Mary Lou and uh, Cheryl are two completely different people. Well, and I think that's really important to, to find somebody that is different from you. I share your boundless enthusiasm for everything and it's really easy to see only the good. And that's, you know, a little bit extreme, but it's really it's really great advice to get somebody who isn't your complimentary. You don't want a yes man or woman. Yeah. Somebody that can, that that can see through your baloney, you know, I mean, I am, I, that I've got a lot of baloney. Like I've got a bunch (laughs) of stuff that I tell myself and, and, and I love it when people tell me, no, Joe, you're wrong. And having that, and and maybe that's my personality is that I kind of like having Gordon Ramsay type people around me. And for people that don't know Gordon Ramsay is, he's this, chef guy that has these kitchen shows where at the beginning of the show, he yells at people and he's in their face. And then you realize halfway through the show, it's because he loves them and he really wants them (laughs) to succeed. But he kind of has to knock down this wall that people have of thinking that they're great at everything. You know, Uh, I get, uh, I get frustrated when I see people try really hard. And I do this myself, by the way, I try very hard to convince people that, that what I think is, is, is right. And I think that I do much better personally if I spend more time asking questions, trying to instead figure out what's correct. You know what I mean? Instead of pushing my right on somebody else, taking the time to go, well, maybe I should search for the better answer instead. I found I've, I've become more of a listener the older I get, um, even though it seems like I can, I can talk pretty well. <laughs> well, go, going back a few steps here. You know, so yeah, we we talked about how you became a CFP and began to get your uh, life, your finances back in order. What can you kind of walk us through some of the levers that you think might have you, you might have pulled to to move that forward? Like, how did you go about paying off your debt? How did you go about building up those savings? And what when did you start? When you like, what was the transition to investing? Yeah. Uh, uh, so first thing was negotiating with with creditors. Um, and I learned that the hard way that, that you had to decide who was worth negotiating with and who wasn't worth negotiating with. And you guys just had Jillian on and you covered all that stuff. Great. So I'm not going to going to, uh, go into that. I think people should just go back and listen to your interview with Jillian to, to dig more into that. But, but I went through that same process of, of, of learning that the second thing then was, was getting, realizing that I needed cash in the bank before I would be completely debt free. Like I could either make sure no bad things ever happen in my life again, or I needed cash to cover the bad things so I wouldn't have to go into debt again while I was getting rid of the mountain of debt. So, uh, so that realization, and actually it wasn't so much a realization as books and people around me telling me that, and me finally being less of a hardhead and figuring out that having this, this, uh, this fund, uh, set aside that was my emergency fund was going to save my bacon. Once I, once I, I got to a point that I knew that the debt was going to be down by a certain day. Then I realized that I needed to invest and invest outside of my business. I need to invest in two different ways. Number one was I needed outside investments, but number two was I needed to also start looking at my business as an investment instead of a place where I work to earn a paycheck. I needed to build it to sell. So I needed to fit, even if I wasn't interested in selling right now. And that was an aha. I had reading another great book, which was the E-Myth. 
you know, and the e-myth is, it seems like every third person I talk to, uh, says the e-myth is their favorite book. And that's another Mindy, going back to your truisms, you hear people say stuff over and over and over. If you haven't read the e-myth, whether you own a business or not, understanding the concepts in the e-myth, I think are a great way to get ahead because I'll tell you just from a personal finance standpoint, another lever I pulled Scott was this. I realized by, by watching smart people around me and from the e-myth that when I stumbled across something cool that I was getting right, I needed to recognize that I'd accidentally hit upon something that was good. And then I needed to figure out a way to automate that so that the next time I tripped on that again, I'd have this tripwire already set up and I'd be able to automatically take advantage of it. So as an example, um, putting money in a cash reserve that was out of sight was one of the early things. Like initially I set up my, my emergency fund at my local bank, but I was a guy who was crappy with money. And if you have a debit card and you're putting a hundred bucks into this cash reserve and you got debit card access and you're not good with money, there's always a reason like your, your brain comes up with these reasons why you got to take the money back out. So I ended up sending my money to a bank account in Minneapolis that I didn't have credit, uh, debit card access to. I lived in Detroit. So I sent it to another city I could have my money overnighted to me was the quickest I could get. I could actually have it wired, but there was going to be a huge wire fee. I could also pay a fee to have it overnighted. And at first I thought, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to pay all these fees to get at my own money. And I thought, how great is this to have like a $40 hurdle between me and my money? And I know that I'm cheap enough that if I got to pay $40 to get my money, my brain will come up with other ways to solve this big quote problem I'm having now. And you know what? It worked. It absolutely worked. And that money started building. And then once the money built, then it became a game. And it's, that was the next thing that, that, that I realized was, um, gamifying things. I, I tripped across, I don't remember what it, what it is, what it was at the time, like what the first thing was that I tripped on here. But I realized that for me, turning things into a game was fun. And so I started setting up these milestones. And when I reached the, when I set myself a milestone, not for five years out, but for six months out and a year out, and I needed to reach that milestone. And I didn't look at the five year number. Like I'm not motivated by a five year number. I'm motivated by the six month number. I'm motivated by the three week number. So if I can take this huge goal and break it down into these little bits and turn it into a game to reach the bit, and then I give myself a reward each time, like for me, that would be like a new board game. That'd be fantastic. Uh, 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 Then I'm more likely to hit that goal. So I started setting up this, I combined automatic savings with shorter milestones and gamification. And for me, that, that was perfect uh, for getting, getting where I wanted to go faster. Yeah. And another key point that I'm observing in this from something you said earlier is your weekly tracking of your progress towards this goal, right? right. In those weekly meetings. Like I, I, I have a similar type, similar type thing. I do six month to 12 month goals, sometimes three months, depending on, I chunk them into three, six, nine, 12 months, depending on what goals they are. And then I track my progress every day and every week towards those goals. And that's what keeps me going towards them. And then of course the reward at the end is is always very I, nice. I don't so. know if it's fun or a sickness. Yeah. It's, maybe it's both, but I, but I love it. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a healthy obsession. It's a healthy, healthy, healthy goal, a healthy habit, right? I totally agree. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back and talk about your debt. When you decided after you were done scrounging through for a quarter, when you decided you were going to pay it off, how much debt did you have? What was it comprised of and how long did it take you to get rid of it? I had $81,000 of debt. Oh, um, yeah. And so it not was, just a little. No. And so it was a combination of, of um, personal loans that I'd taken out for a quote for my business, um, which once again, I had to get my, my, my business under control as well and create separate entities. And, you know, I mean, that's a whole different show. Uh, but it was a combination of personal loans, credit card debt, student loans, and on top of all this stuff, I also didn't understand how taxes work. And I ended up owing the IRS a bunch of money that I actually, I know today, I never owed this money. I just didn't know how to track my expenses. I didn't know how to. And so because of that, uh, I also didn't know how to hire the right people in my corner. 
uh, I hired an accountant who wasn't really an accountant, was just a dude to put the numbers together, even though he was a CPA. And I went to him and I don't remember what the number was anymore. I think it was about $30,000, $35,000. He said, uh, hey, Joe, you owe $35,000 and uh, that's due next week. And here I'm a guy that has tons of debt, you know, spending every penny plus more that I make. And I'm like, where am I supposed to? I remember being so mad at him and going, where am I supposed to come up with that money? And then I realized later when I found good help, when I realized from once again, from mentorship and that I need to surround myself with good people, I found a great CPA who understood how taxes work. But by then the the horse had left the barn and I, I was beyond being able to go back and uh, figure out where all that, where all those expenses were, but there's no way I owed all that money. But not only did I owe that money, I owed that money plus penalties, right? Because the IRS, if you just once again, look away. The IRS uh, doesn't look at that kindly. And so I, yeah, yeah. When we finally, when I finally looked at it and wrote everything down, we were over 80,000 bucks. Wow. And how long did it take you to pay that off? Oh God, it felt like it took forever. I think I didn't get it all paid off for seven years. Uh, it took two years to pay down, to pay down the, the, the credit card debt part. Um, Overall, to pay off all the debt, though, uh, it took seven years. At, at some point, in your, when you're paying this down, you, you say, "Hey, I see the date that I'm going to get to zero. Is that? I think you said that earlier. Yes. And you, and I assume at that point you began building up that emergency fund and beginning to invest. Is that right? So you were were you investing at any point during this time, or is it you waited till yeah. you got to zero? Oh, oh no, no, no. The, the the last few years, the last three years, I had gotten my credit score better. Um, and I began, uh, transferring things to lower interest debt. Um, and as I was able to transfer things to lower interest debt and I had an emergency fund in place and I knew that that was taking care of itself, I also knew I had to start investing. So then I started putting money then into, uh, into first my retirement fund and then second into brokerage accounts. And then later I became a, became a landlord. What was your, what was your kind of philosophy as you approached investing? My, boy, my philosophy at first, my philosophy at first was just do it. I mean, it's funny because I think that I think that philosophy for me was just I got to do something. So I I didn't. Hey, buy a mutual fund. I mean, I bought growth mutual funds, um, growth no load mutual funds through decent places. I mean, I wasn't buying anything super inexpensive. I wasn't paying a lot of attention to having the perfect investment. I, I was trying to just buy aggressive stuff. Um, and it's funny because my whole philosophy around investing changed later once I had money. And I tell people starting out that too, I, I don't know that I'd worry. You know, it's funny because I was, my daughter and I were having this conversation. She was setting up her 401k last year. And, um, when she was doing that, she and I agreed, why, why wouldn't you just put everything in your 401k when you're first starting out into the small cap value fund? Like just put it in the most aggressive thing, because if you've got a hundred bucks there and it goes down 10%, you lost 10 bucks. So just put in the most aggressive thing you can find and just go like, don't overthink it, just go. And now it's cool. She saved a ton of money her first year, uh, working. And, um, as that money grows, I think diversifying it out is going to make more sense later. But initially Scott, I, my, 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 my whole philosophy was just do it. It was just, it was all the Nike thing. And actually, you know what? It wasn't even that. It was, it was Nike had a phrase before that, that I liked better. Like I like just do it, but, but, but Nike's old, uh, old phrase was feel the fear and do it anyway. And I felt a ton of fear and I still feel a ton of fear. So I just remember thinking, yeah, I just got to do something. So my philosophy was you're screwed if you don't start saving. So sock some money into a mutual fund, pal. No, I, I, I think that's a very appropriate uh, way to kind of rationalize things. When you're starting out investing, right, you're, you should, you know, whatever you're going to accumulate over that course of that year, you're going to be investing for a long time, hopefully, you know, 50, 60, 70 more years. You, it, it, uh, you, you, why don't you go ahead and 
invest in something that you think is going to have the highest possible long-term results, and then who cares what happens in the in the very short term? Right? It's your savings rate and the amount that you accumulate and put away that is the big driver of growth until you get to maybe six figures in investable liquidity, right? Investments. That's when now, okay, now 10% of, of that is going to be a meaningful hit to your overall financial position in a given year. That's what that's what I think. I think the closer you get to wanting to start the spending pattern with your money, the more analytical you have to get. I mean, I think ultimately you should be very analytical, but not when you start out. I think people spend, you know, and we get questions on our show. You guys get questions. People ask us all the time about, you know, I'm, I'm 22 and what do I do? And it's feel the fear and do it. <laughs> you know, just, just, just go do it. But let's say, and, and this is really what we're, I, I love, I love the whole idea of the fire movement. I think it's fantastic. What I worry about though, is there are some people who are entering the years where they're pulling the trigger on fire and they're not, um, analytical enough about some of the numbers. I think, I think when it's time to pull the trigger and say, you know what, I'm now going to be financially independent. I think that's the time when you got to have all those little nitty gritty numbers that I learned as a financial planner, uh, uh, but not when you're starting out. Yeah, and, and I think that there's a there's a conundrum in the in the fire movement as well, in the sense that when you have like like it seems like a lot of the fire folks are talking about, hey, I'm going to stockpile a ton of index funds, and then I'm going to invest that because that's a high probability way of generating long term wealth. I'm going to live off of that, in, you know, going forward. Well, the reality is. You know, I, I put up a poll in another Facebook, a Choose FI Facebook group amongst people who actually were retired or had a retirement level of wealth. Almost nobody actually retires off an index fund portfolio alone. Almost everybody's got like a couple of other extra tricks up their sleeves, including an index fund portfolio that would actually sustain them. So, what, yeah, so don't get fooled by, hey, the path to retirement is build up 25 times your net worth in an index fund and then you're done. You know, that's not mentally what people are able to wrap their heads around because everyone's analytical by the time they actually pull the trigger. Everyone's got a rental property, a pension, you know, or part or stays working or works part time. That's going on after they retire. Not everybody, but a large proportion of the folks in the fire movement. Well, the one thing I learned, Scott, to your point, is that as a financial planner, is that while something might not seem to go wrong to you when you're managing your own money, when mm -hmm. you're working with 200 families, Something's always going wrong with somebody like I've yep. seen so many things go wrong with people's investments. And uh, w so having multiple in investment strategies or well, one overall strategy, but different tactics, I guess, three or four different tactics, tactics you're pursuing instead of just dividend paying stocks or just purely rental real estate or just and don't get me wrong. I think you should go strong with the thing that you know the best, mm -hmm. right? If, 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 if rental real estate's your thing and, and you're great at that, lead with that, make that the hull of your ship, but your ship still, still should have a different sale, maybe have a different Spinnaker sale of a different anchor, you know, I'm just trying to think of pieces of a ship, but just to have other things that complement that so that if something does go wrong in the real estate market, you're not sitting just there. You've got other places to turn. Yeah, I love that. I, I think that's fantastic advice. Yeah. Like, and, and, and you don't hear that very often. You hear, here's the ideal portfolio allocation, you know, yeah. from a, but, but what you're making saying is makes perfect sense. I'm a little over invested in real estate compared to what most people would say is, is reasonable, but I work at bigger pockets. Right. I talk about real estate <laughs> investing all day long. I'm super comfortable with my portfolio there, and I should be overextended in real estate investing, right? And I do have stocks and other things, and I have you know other income sources that I that I'm continuing to work on. And but that's the bulk of my portfolio, and that makes sense for me. It might not not make sense for somebody else who well, doesn't I'll feel as you, comfortable. I'll give you another story that way. I had clients when I was a financial advisor. They came to me, and they were very surprised. When when I came back to, 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 you know, we had a first meeting where I get to know them. They tell me about themselves. I then come back with suggestions and strategies in my second meeting. And then we have a whiteboard and we start working through together how the plan's going to kind of come together. Cause it's not my plan. I'm not delivering it. We're going to figure it out, but I'm going to bring some suggestions. And the one suggestion they were most surprised about, I told them that they, the lead in their portfolio should be livestock. 
because this dude and his family, that's what they knew. And he knew like clockwork how to get a 10% rate of return in livestock, but not just that, not just get a 10% on going rate of return there. He also knew the downsides if it didn't work and he knew how to protect against those downsides. And I thought that was fascinating. And by the way, they thought it was fascinating to me as a financial advisor, because every other advisor they met before me, of course, had said, you know, lead with something that I can help you manage. You should always lead with what you know best. Um, and then we diversified around around uh, cattle and pigs. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> Holy cow. Oh, God, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that, that makes perfect sense to me. And I also I also recently, I don't know where I came across this, but apparently cows are worth a lot of money. Like a, one cow is worth like three grand or something like that. I, I couldn't, I couldn't on the cow. when I was looking through their spreadsheets, I remember my, my client, Brian, just walking through his spreadsheets and I walk through every piece of his spreadsheets. Cause I find that a lot of people, uh, there there's flaws in their spreadsheet, right? Yeah. And, and I'm thinking, okay, you've got this ongoing 10% rate of return, sometimes much, much higher than that. Uh, show me how this works. And he walked me, I think we might've spent three hours talking about how this works, where I was confident enough that I said, why wouldn't we lead with this? Because just like you with real estate, Scott, working at bigger pockets, it's what he does every day. It's what the dude knows. Like, let's, let, let's make sure we start with what you know. Cause I'll tell you when something goes wrong, if you know the underpinnings of why it goes wrong, you're much more likely to respond in the appropriate way. What I worried most about when I was a financial planner, what I still worry most about is that when the stock market goes down again, and it's going to go down again, when the stock market goes down, it's hard to predict how people are going to respond. And what I found was people that were more in touch with their portfolio and they kind of knew why their stocks were down they were much more likely to respond appropriately. But people that just wanted to push it off to me as their advisor and have me just, quote, handle it, they were the people that went off the deep end when all of a sudden the stock market goes down. And even if, you know, even if we're down 20% when the stock market's down 35, so I pretty much saved their ass, those people were still really, really, really upset with me. I'm like, why didn't you handle this better? Like, I don't think you understand what we did. Like our strategy was defensive enough that you didn't lose your ass as much as everybody. And they're like, I don't care about everybody else. Well, well, (laughs) long, long. Yeah, I could go. I could go on and on and on about some 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 frustrating things that happen when people would. And frankly, that's part of the reason why I left being a financial planner was I, I loved it when people wanted to learn more about money. I didn't like it when somebody wanted to hand it off. You should never hand off your money to somebody else. Have coaches in your corner. But listen, if you've hired somebody to just take it, this is your net worth you're talking about. Nobody cares about that as much as you do. So um, you should be very careful with your money. No, I, I think a good example of this is index fund investing again, right? So I invest in index funds. I've got a lot of money in, in, in uh, Vanguard index funds, low fee index funds. However, I do that because I've studied both sides of the issue of, hey, why is why, what are the advantages here? What are the disadvantages? Why shouldn't I build my own portfolio of accumulated stocks? And I'm comfortable with that. And I think a lot of people are just like, oh, passive index funds, the easy option. I'm going to do that without really understanding all those concepts. And there's going to be different certain types of reactions that you have to go through in different market cycles. I think that's going to be an interesting test for me and for a lot of other people that are going to go through maybe their first recession with some savings built up. That's that's the part. Well, no, you think about how long it's been, right? It's been nine years since the downturn. You you can have a financial advisor look you in the eye and say, I've got nine years experience. And that sounds like a long time. You know, somebody's got almost a decade of experience. Holy cow, your experience. They've never seen a freaking downturn. Like mm-hmm. they, they haven't seen a downturn. I went through two in my career. That's where all my hair went. It is, it is horrible. <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, you're watching, I'm in Detroit. I'm watching the auto companies go bankrupt. We're watching crap on wall street every day. We're watching people lose their houses, lose their jobs that you never thought were going to like, you don't know when it's going to end. It was, it was horrible. I thought your hair went to your chest. Was that what we were talking about? <laughs> that's yeah. right. no, that's no, his brother. You know what happened to me? <laughs> I now only grow hair out of my nose and my ears. That is the, I don't know if that's age thing or, or what, but I feel like I'm constantly creating hair, that, but not on top of my head. It's very frustrating. It's an oh, age man. thing and a man thing. So Scott, in a couple <laughs> of years, you can look forward to that too. I look forward to it. 
<laughs> I'm going to let it grow. Okay, so Joe, you've assumed, I'm assuming that you've paid off all of this debt now. You talk about it in the past tense. Um, yes. Where are you on the path to financial independence? And financial independence, I am describing is, I don't have to work anymore. Clearly, you do still work. Um, but when you do what you love, it's never a job or whatever. Yeah. No, my spouse and I still work. And you know what's funny is that if you look at some of the people in the and 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 I don't want to rip the fire movement because I think it is it's fantastic. And I think people are doing some amazing things and I love the stories and I love the enthusiasm for savings and we need more of that, right? I mean, we need so much more of that. The community, our community needs to be so much bigger. But I'll tell you, I have a lot more money than a lot of people who tell me that they're financially independent. <laughs> and yet, when I look at my numbers and my assumptions, I'm just going to be more conservative. So so uh, to answer your question, Mindy, I work because I like it. My spouse works because she likes it. We, we could quit tomorrow, and, and I'm sure that we would be fine. But, um, but uh, I'm, I'm a pretty conservative guy. Uh, but like you said, I love what I do. I can't imagine, you know, I, I feel bad sometimes for when I read some people in some of the forums who are so excited about getting rid of their work, uh, about, um, about, uh, about not working, um, because of the fact that I think there's nothing wrong with a life well worked. I think, I think work is, work is a fun thing. Like, you know, what, what you, not to parrot what you just said, Mindy, but really if, if you love what I do, I can't imagine not doing the, my podcast now. Like I want, I want to finish an episode and like keel over. Like that would be my ultimate <laughs> step. Like I just finished interviewing Scott and Mindy on my show and then I keel over and die like that. that hey, take me. That's fantastic. Please don't die. Please don't die. Please don't die. <laughs> so I have a couple of things to say about this. It sounds like you've only had jobs that you loved. And I had a couple where I did not love them so much. So I'm assuming all these people that are in these, these Facebook groups and that are out there saying, I can't wait to quit are in jobs that they don't love. I worked for several people because if I quit, I couldn't pay my mortgage. I couldn't eat. Yeah. I couldn't put gas in my car. Um, but I certainly did not love those jobs. And I was actively looking all the time to get a different job because I hated what I was doing, who I was working for, you know, whatever the, the political atmosphere of that job. Um, and I, I think that there are a lot of people who are focused solely on, I can't wait till I get out of my job. But you're yeah. right. Working is fun. I get up and, you know, this sounds kind of disingenuous because I am actually at work when I'm saying this. Um, but I get up in the morning and I'm so excited to go to work. I, my husband is now a stay at home dad and he's getting the kids ready for school and they're, they're close in age. So they're fighting all the time or the little one lags forever and they're in the middle of a fight. And I'm like, okay, got to go to work. Like I'm excited to go. I feel guilty <laughs> that I'm leaving these two fighting kids or, you know, the one that doesn't want to go to school today. And I feel really guilty about that as I'm leaving, but I'm leaving because I love my job and I cannot wait to go. So no, I had, I had bad jobs. I had bad jobs too. But like you, I, I realized early that that wasn't a way I wanted to, to, to spend my life. And, you know, I, I kind of threw my parents under the bus early in the, in the show. And so I'm going to circle back though and say, you know, from my dad and my mom, they, they did jobs that they loved and they loved working. And I, I think I inherited that from them that if I didn't love a job, A, I had to bring enthusiasm to it, but then B, I had to either find a way to love that job or I had to find a job that I loved. And so I kept searching for jobs that I loved. And when I didn't love financial planning anymore at age 40, I sold that business and, uh, and moved into, you know, the, the piece of it that I really do like the financial media piece. Yeah. And, and I think that one thing I want to point out about both you guys and a lot of other stories that are kind of like this about how you, we, we, you know, fire, but love our jobs is you, the, as your financial means increase, as you increase the savings rate, you have p other sources of income and you're less dependent on these jobs in order to get by. I think that there's a lot more, you're not going to, you're just not going to tolerate work that is not, that is not satisfying, that is not satisfying. So you yeah. move 
gradually and you know it's different for everybody and their risk tolerance but i think that you move gradually towards work that you really do love uh as you get closer and closer to you know a, a reasonable approximation of fire and then it ends up being work, a job and i think there's just story is just repeated time and again across you know hundreds of people or maybe thousands of people at least dozens that i've met <laughs> well and yeah. when when you're not working for a paycheck you can do something that you enjoy even if it doesn't pay w- really well. My husband always wanted to be a uh, ranger, like a park ranger. But that doesn't pay anything. It's like $10 an hour or something. So to support a family in an expensive cost of living area, being a park ranger isn't the best choice. But now that you have reached, he has reached financial independence. I, I say he, we have reached financial independence. Then he can go pursue these jobs that don't pay much or even, you know, go start his own thing that doesn't pay anything at first. You know, you, fi- you find out what you're doing, but you're optimizing your life for your happiness. And that's, that's the most important thing. Yeah. I think, I think finding a way to push back that uh, hand to mouth as quickly as possible is, is an important thing for anybody. Like uh, uh, how long can I hold on to this dollar before I need it to eat? You know, and if I can, if I can push that away, then I don't need to be chasing the next paycheck. I can chase instead what really fulfills me. Yeah. Yeah. And that is the best life lived. Yeah. All right. So one, one topic that I think we want to cover before we get to the famous four is some assumptions that maybe are wrong in the fire community or something that need to be challenged or debated. So, uh, is this something let's, let's go ahead and transition into that with a very awkward transition there. (laughs) Well, no, actually it kind of gets back to what I said earlier is that I think some people have some that aren't, aren't looking at all the numbers. Maybe we'll nerd out here for a little bit for some numbers. Cause I'm a guy who lived a early life of wrong assumptions. And, and so I think some people don't take, um, don't use some of the right stats. I'll tell you, uh, a few big ones. Number one, the 4% rule. I, I see the 4% rule quoted a lot, which means if you live on 4% of your, in, uh, of the money that you have, if you can accumulate that, that, that that's going to be enough. Uh, financial planners have ripped that to shreds guys. That, that thing was uh, used one point in time. It wasn't enough research. Um, and so living off 4% of your money, not a great, uh, not a great place to start. Um, that's interesting. I would like to point out, because you said it, and I just want to reiterate this, it is 4% of the amount that you have saved, not 4% of your income. Right. There, was, there were several articles. Percent of your income? No, but there were several articles recently in um, local publications that people were commenting, I could never live off of 4% of my income. Yeah, same. Yeah. (laughs) Unless I get a 1,200% raise, I'm not living off of 4% of my income either. It is 4% of the money that you have saved. So this is interesting because that's kind of my plan, although I also have a job and – my number was here, and now with the stock market, it's gone up a little bit. Um, William Bengen did the original study, and then the Trinity Group came in and verified it. I'm curious what you, why you say that this is not kosher. Well, uh, Wade Fow is a certified financial planner who um, brought it to my attention. Um, and he's a guy who is often quoted, um, and he may not even be the guy that, uh, that, uh, ripped it first, but, but the fact that this was only, uh, worked in, in a, in a very specific time frame. Uh, makes it suspect. And if you look at many time frames over the last, uh, well, since, since the great depression, you'll find that 4% wouldn't have, your money wouldn't have lasted forever. I don't even like using that. So here's what I like. I like that as a place to start. Like if you're just going to do, you know, like the rule of 72, which we won't even, you know, I just opened up another can of worms for people who don't know that. <laughs> go, go Wikipedia that. I'm sorry I brought that up. But the, but, but the 4% rule, if you're just using your fingers, you're like, okay, how much money can I live on? Okay, decent place to start. But, but why wouldn't you actually plot out the numbers? Because plotting out the numbers is not as hard as you think it is. It is actually way easier than you think it is. So using a lot of these just rules of thumb versus saying, I'm going to live on X amount of money 
and then have have your there's tons of financial planning software online and where you can then see if the money that you've accumulated will fill in that need so start with the need and work backwards I think if you follow Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and begin with the end in mind, how much do I need to live? How long do I think I'm going to live? Add some time to that so you don't run out of money. And then see if the amount of money that you have based on a reasonable interest rate will last that period of time. I think it's a way better way to do it. Sure, it might take you a few hours versus three minutes, but, but this is a whole, you know, this might be half your life. If, if, if you're going to retire in your 40s, it could be more than half your life. So so take some time and do the real math instead of using a, a, a 4% rule. Um, another thing there on that point, by the way, inflation. Inflation is another thing I think people don't take seriously enough. And by the way, if you're using the government statistic on inflation, <laughs> oh boy, that's a whole nother podcast. Don't laugh. But, but, but let's just say it this way. It is incorrect. The government number is is not the real number. There have been years where there's been zero inflation and cost on a lot of things went up and up and up. So using a reasonable number like three or four percent for inflation, I think, is 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 a better way to go. Once again, to be conservative, especially if I'm going to chase early financial independence, I'm going to jack up that inflation number to four. I'm going to use the higher inflation number because if it works at four, it'll work at anything below that. Um, So that's another one. Yeah, the, uh, I see the four percent rule as a good milestone. Hey, if you're getting to the four percent rule and you're getting close to that in terms of your net worth and inv- invested assets, this is not your house, maybe you know your home liquidity. This is like, hey, this is equity and rental properties and stocks and all that. Okay, you're getting pretty good. Prob- all probability, you're going to be better off in most retirement scenarios than the rest of the population by a large amount, right? And you're you're got a reasonable odds of sustaining that. But the reality of the situation is. People aren't satisfied with the four percent rule. People aren't stopping. Families, I, I see very few families that are actually stopping once they hit the four percent rule in a portfolio and doing nothing else and having no other side income streams. And I think that that's a that's telling, right? What, whatever it is, whatever all the math is and the argument, it's just not good enough for your ordinary person. That's that's listening. There, there's always a backup plan that's yeah. going on as soon as you actually do leave that job. Yeah. And I think that's a good point. You know, use the 4% rule. And then once you get there, Scott, now start running the real numbers. Yeah. <laughs> now at that point, now it's time. The 4% rule is when the, the beacon goes off that says, now it's time for me to, for me to actually dig in. But I will tell you at the very least from the 4% rule, I bet you that you will never have to work a job you don't like ever again. R- agreed. Right? And I think that's, that's the, the real victory you get to when you get to that 4% rule, right? Yeah. And, and and by the way, the reason the 4% rule doesn't work in some occasions is what they call sequence of return risk. Meaning if you shut off your income stream today and the market goes down immediately, and let's say you lose 40% of your portfolio the first couple of years of retirement, you're screwed. Yeah. Um, so sequence of return risk, I think a lot of times people don't compensate enough for that, which means, especially once again, if you're going to go early, I want to have a big enough reserve. I was talking to a financial planner just a few weeks ago who said he likes having eight years of money in very conservative assets to avoid sequence of return risk. I think that's incredibly conservative. Like, I think that's over the top uh, conservative, but, but, but I still get his point that I want to avoid uh, making the mistake of retiring and then have all my investments fall apart the first couple of years. Yeah. And, and let's, let's all put this in perspective too. Like you, you retire and, and the market immediately tanks and you lose 40% of your portfolio. The only people that are worse off than you is everybody else. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> everybody else is worse off than you and you could just maybe go back to work and not make quite as much money. That was awesome. <laughs> well, I'm going to tag onto what Scott was saying just a moment ago. The personality traits that allow you to think ahead and save this much money and be this aggressive in your retirement planning are the same traits that kind of won't let you sit around and do nothing once you get there. So you're not going to aggressively save and then just be like, ooh, what's on TV today? I'm going to Netflix and chill for 17 hours. That just doesn't happen. So while you're not, you might be making $100,000 in your first job and your next job makes you 10, you're still doing something. You're still bringing in money. And with this low rate of spending and this 
low rate of income, you're kind of balancing it out. So I do not want to bash the 4% rule, although I totally hear what you're saying. Um, yeah, you're already in a better place than everybody else. I'm Yeah, I'm just seeing an over-reliance on it. And uh, that's fair. I guess great. Okay. Yes. What yeah, else do you hate it. about fire people, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Send your hate mail to, right? Joe uh, at... <laughs> yeah, no, I think these are just stumbling blocks that I'd like to see more people avoid. Um, and I do see a lot of people avoid them. Uh, so I'm glad we're bringing a light to them. I also, uh, we already talked about this next one, which is over-reliance on one asset class. I think I think there's a big danger on saying that, that you know, dividend stocks, dividend paying stocks are my strategy. And that's all my money. And I'm going to do it just that way. I, I, something goes wrong in every asset class. So I don't want that. But you know what the biggest ones are? When I was when I was thinking of issues, the biggest issue that I see that that, that I think we want to be cognizant of is this feeling that I'm going to feel the same about my life 15 years from now that I feel today. And I'll tell you that doesn't happen. As a guy who's 50 years old, I don't feel at all the same about my life as I did at 25. And my goals are different. My my desire to spend money is different. Um, so if I lock myself into a lifestyle that's incredibly limiting at a at a young age, um, I really would be wary of that. I really I really get get wary of somebody that says that I like to live in a woods in a tent, and I'm you know 31 years old and I saved a hundred thousand dollars so I can I can do that forever. I've done the math and I can you know live off this money and never do anything differently. I, by 50, you might not want to live in that tent. Okay, no, so I this is the problem with the the audio is that I can't put an asterisk next to what you're saying, and <laughs> I I totally hear what you're saying. Completely do not disagree with that. But if you lock your, if you are young and you are getting used to this super frugal lifestyle, you're only going to do better as you go on. Oh, I saved too much money. You know, now I can buy a Porsche. Like that's not a bad thing. Well, I, I would say I would say the way I view it is as as someone is I understand this. I I don't spend very much money right now, and I don't have a desire to spend a lot of money. But I understand that that's going to change most likely, and I'm going to want to spend more money, if nothing else, to at least have a home in a good school district if I uh, have kids. kids. Yeah. Right. And and like there's going to be expenses that come in. So I'm not sitting here saying, oh, I'm done now. My passive yeah. income could could cover my lifestyle right now, which is very conservative, where I, I live in a half a duplex. That is going to change, right? So why would I – Why would I? I'm not going to stop right now, right? But I feel like the way you can kind of do it is you can spend in proportion to your passive income that you're, that you're generating from your portfolio, right? That's what you can – that's how you can allow that. If you're going to allow lifestyle creep, as I am sure will happen in my life, it should come in proportion to the passive income that I'm continuing to build, right. not, not from my income that I'm generating from my job. So. But you just need to give yourself the opportunity to build a portfolio enough that, that that you can allow for changes to happen in the future. That's what I'm talking about. I think there's some plans that are built on not enough flexibility. Yep. Um, I think that a lot of things are going to change. And by the way, on flexibility, let's talk about that too. Uh, you know, the tax laws are going to change. I mean, every time I talk to a tax expert, uh, all that I hear is, is that – it's a math problem. The government's going to have to tap into some of these investments where we have tax shelters. And so we don't know where that's going to hit. We don't know if it's going to hit pre-tax money. That's probably where it will hit, right? Where 401ks might not work the way they work now, or IRAs might not work the way they work. It could hit Roths. But most tax experts are telling us um, that, that that's probably less likely, but it could hit there. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the HSA, uh, loophole, uh, that we all love right now, socking as much money into HSAs as we possibly can, that, that, that loophole might go away. But I think, 
I think having a plan that's flexible enough to realize that a lot of these rules that we're using might change and to keep checking in to make sure that as changes happen, that I'm abreast of those changes, I think is a super important thing, especially if you're trying to be super aggressive with your um, financial independence. If you're going for aggressive financial independence, staying on top of that and being flexible, I think is, is going to be huge for you. Okay. That is a really great way to say that. I, I appreciate you uh, explaining a little bit more. What I was trying to and completely did not succeed doing is saying, you know, get in the habit of not spending a lot of money. If you want to be financially independent, get into this frugality habit. You can always change later and have this lifestyle creep and spend more. That's way easier to change that mindset, I would think, than to change the one oh. of entitlement. And, you know, the story that always comes into my mind is Tori Spelling. She grew up, her dad is Aaron Spelling. He was behind every single TV show in the 80s. Scott, you don't know The Love Boat and 90210 I'm, I'm, I'm and like I'm everything. I'm listening. I'm listening and learning. <laughs> you don't know all these shows, but I remember Aaron Spelling on every single TV show. And she grew up in this like batrillion dollar house and her dad's like, hey, you want another shopping cart full of money today? Like it was kind of ridiculous. And then when she, when her dad died, he didn't leave her anything. And I'm not really sure what happened with all of that. Like her mom got all the money and this isn't going to be a Tory Spelling show. But now she's constantly in the news because she has this bill that she can't pay to your favorite American Express. Or she can't, like she's getting kicked out of her house because she didn't pay her rent. I think, don't quote me, allegedly. I don't want to get sued. But like she's having a lot of money problems because she's been in this mindset for so long of just, I can spend anything. And when you have this mindset of, oh, I can't spend anything, Oh, wait, I could buy a new pair of shoes for Joe and Scott, who only has one. I could go out to dinner tonight and it's not going to change my world. Um, yeah. So I would definitely recommend to be on the side of caution. But that's a really good point is life is not going to continue the same way forever. Sure. But it, it, and it's funny you say that because, you know, we we kick this off talking about Scott's book. And one thing that my son really took from from that book was it's easier for you to um, begin with these great habits around how you buy your house and about how you what your transportation costs are than if you're somebody like me, let's say at 50 years old or, or like me when I finally got my act together back when I was what, 35, uh, figuring out exactly what am I, what are we, what are we going to do differently? And now I already have the house issue. I already have the car issue. Now I have to solve some of these big problems and reduce my expenses. But if you start off on the right foot, uh, to your point, Mindy, and build those early, I think I think it's going to be way easier for you because then when you have the extravagance, you're going to appreciate it more. You know, I found that, that when we start having our money meetings, one of the things that we cut, like a lot of people, was going out to dinner constantly. And I found that if we go out to dinner at a restaurant once a week, we really flip and enjoy it. Like we we love it. But but when we're super busy, Cheryl and I, and we love being busy people, or if I'm on the road and I go out to dinner four nights in a row, I don't appreciate it all anymore. And, and you know, and it's super fattening food and I feel worse. And But man, that once a week is a great date night. Yep. Perfect. Okay. What else do you hate about fire people? <laughs> I don't hate anything <laughs> about fire. I love fire people. I'm just I, kidding, Joe. I, what, uh, what, do you I have love- any other... No, I think the big thing though is is b- b- behavior. I think that uh, th- th- that monitoring monitoring your um, monitoring your behavior and realizing that you're going to think differently over time and thinking about how you think differently over time and realizing that when the markets change, keeping your emotions in check and having systems with your investing. So as an example, I said earlier that Cheryl and I uh, will change our investments twice a year. That is a system. Good financial planners have something that we can all replicate called an investment policy statement. So earlier, Scott asked me what my philosophy was around investing when I started. Didn't have one, didn't really need one. Now that I have a portfolio, 
I manage my money based on an investment policy statement. I know what my guidelines are so that when it hits the fan and we know it's going to hit the fan at some point when it hits the fan, I'm not going to wonder, how do I react? How do I respond? I'm not reacting or responding. I'm pulling the levers that I already said I was going to pull. I knew this day was going to come. I know how I'm going, what I'm going to do because it's already written out. Um, and I love that. I love having an investment policy statement versus just being emotional. I, you need to keep your emotions in check when you're uh, talking about your money. Yeah. So I want to throw in one thing I don't like about the FIRE movement. Right. If I get if I get a bonus fund. <laughs> so one thing that I don't like about the FIRE movement is the dogma, I think, that comes with a lot of folks that where where other people are making the wrong choice by not following the FIRE movement. I see that oh. in a lot of things. And I, and I really feel that that's not helpful to our movement. That's not, We want everyone to be – to acknowledge, understand the benefits and the possibility of fire. But I think that there's a lot of people out there who take that a little too far. Once you get going on this path, maybe judge people who are not making what you consider to be the correct decisions with money. Man, I think you hit it on the head. Our community is so small. It is, it is so small. And it's funny because when I talk to new podcasters getting into the, the financial podcasting field, they're like, well, there's already so many good podcasts. And I'm like, no, but, but there's, there's not really, when you look at the population of the United States versus the number of people who listen to financial podcasts, there's room for a lot more podcasters. There's a room for a lot more people. We need a lot more people talking about this. And you're right, Scott, I think being judgy at all is just, just going to turn people off. Like we, we can't afford to be judgy. I think the more people are proactive that are proactive with their money, it gets more exciting for, for all of us. It's funny. You know, I talked about the mentor earlier who talked about avoiding clusters of misery. He also had another thing he told me, which was, uh, you can have what's called a limited pie mentality or an unlimited pie mentality. And I think we should, we should, we should advocate an unlimited pie mentality. There's, there's room for a lot of great voices. We, we need more great people talking about this stuff. Um, and when we become judgy of each other, it doesn't, it doesn't help us do that. Yeah. I, I think we just, I think it's, Hey, you work towards fire and do the best that you can build your, build your personal financial position, work towards financial freedom and then live a good life. And that's how you can invite more people into this movement when they ask and are ready to come in. But you know, I, I, I am a culprit of this going out into the community or, or, or to other people and saying, you're doing it wrong. I'm doing it right. Here's how <laughs> to do it. And I, and I fully admit that I've done that in the past. And I, you know, I'm, I'm uh, saying that here and saying, Hey, don't, let's not do that. Let's, let's invite, let's just keep doing what we're doing. And more people will probably see the benefits and continue to, to learn about it. I love it when somebody says that they discovered us, any of us, you know, in the past six months, I was thinking that's exciting. Cause I remember that journey. I, re I mean, I remember right after digging for those quarters and thinking, I got to get it together, man. And I remember how empowering that was, but I didn't really know what it was, yep. you know, and just that first step of the journey. I think if we put ourselves in those shoes that everybody's got that first step of the journey and put yourself back there, it's a fun place to be and to help people along. Yep, yeah, absolutely. It's very fun. You discover it and you're like, Ooh, I have to change everything. And, and it's then a so couple exciting. of it is exciting. And then a couple of months later, you're like, I hate this. I don't want to change everything. I want this back added back in. And you know, we we mentioned Liz Frugalwoods at the beginning of the show as somebody who has a money date with her husband every week or every month. Um, she also discovered financial independence, cut out everything. Right. And then after the first month, she's like, well, I miss this. How can I add it back in frugally? I miss this. How can I add that back in frugally? And she had a lot of really great tips for things you can do once you go down the rabbit hole and discover you don't want to be all the way down at the bottom. I saw that all the time as a financial planner. You'd see people that would, they'd cut their budget to the bone and they'd do great for three months and then they'd celebrate by buying a big screen TV. Right? <laughs> I mean, just at the end of three months, they're like, I've been so good about this. I'm just going to, you know, they go off the other side. So this whole boom bust cycle of getting way too intense and realizing it's going to be a long, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint, I think is also a good idea. Yeah. It is a marathon, not a sprint. And, you know, if we're going to go with cliches, Personal finance is personal. 
and what you spend your money on, Joe, is completely wrong and is not what I choose to spend my money on, which is, you know, not what Scott chooses to spend his money on. So spend on what really matters so you can save on the things that you don't care about. I think we all just turned into my mom there the last like four minutes. Like Hi, giving mom. financial truisms. Yeah. Nice job. Okay. Now it's time to make our way over to the famous four questions. These are the same five questions that we ask everybody all the time at the end of the show. What, Joe Salci High, is your favorite finance book? Uh, the, my favorite finance book is Rick Edelman's The Truth About Money. I think it's the most even-handed book on personal finance I've, I've read. Uh, I think it's comprehensive. So I think where I see a lot of people, speaking of what Scott was talking about earlier, about people being kind of judgy, you see a lot of books are kind of judgy. It's one of the most non-judgy books I've read. And the better thing for me, because uh, I like a lot of humor with my stuff, is that the book's, the book's funny. He's, he's explaining how, how things changed around, around Roth IRAs. And he's, he goes through this whole, this whole explanation and he says, and, and, and by the way, here's the reason they made this one very technical change. Turn the page for it. You turn the page and he goes, I don't know why, but that's not important. <laughs> so I find myself at the beginning of the next page laughing a lot. And, and I love that. So Rick Edelman's the truth about money is uh, my number one. Oh, that's, that's awesome. awesome. All right. So what was your biggest money mistake? Hiding from the tax man. Explained that earlier. Do not hide from the tax man. Uh, that the, you, you have to put your mistakes down in writing and you have, to, uh, you have to attack them, but especially when it's the IRS. Love it. Yeah, he will, he will find you. Um, I'm going to take this time to say hi to my favorite tax man, my friend Evan. Hi, Evan. Uh, okay, back to Joe, because he's the focus of the show today. Oh, thank what, you. What is your best piece of advice for people who are just starting out? Just do it. Well, actually, feel the fear and do it anyway. You know, we all feel afraid. We feel afraid of what we don't know. But but feel that it's okay to be afraid, but don't let that stop you. I love that. I like my, my, my most difficult question here is what is your favorite joke to tell at parties? And I know that you in particular have a huge arsenal of these things, right? But I don't tell jokes at parties. I mean, I, I, I don't, but if you tell me a joke, I'll know four others that are like it, which is bad. But, 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 but if I were to tell a joke at a party, it would have to be a bad dad joke. Oh, so, good. You'll fit in. Perfect. Perfect. Yes, it there. has to. So what did the pirate say when he turned 80? I uh, 80. I'm 80. I like it. <laughs> That's I the don't. same thing he said when he went to the golf course. <laughs> I may T. Ah, but I'm both. He's here all week. Tip your weight. Yeah. Yep, uh, I'll be, I, he's always. Here all week. Yes. <laughs> so I read in one of those Facebook groups, uh, somebody said, I thought this was very cute. Somebody said, um, Mindy Jensen has a really tough job because she has to listen to Scott's jokes all day long. And then somebody, <laughs> resp too. somebody responded, yeah. has to or gets to? Right. And I replied, has to. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think it's more gets to. I, yeah, I, no. I think some people hate them, some people love them, but everybody is eagerly anticipates them at the end of the show. So <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> hey, did you hear that there was a, that there was a, a murder down at the IKEA store? No, I didn't hear. Police are having trouble putting the pieces together. Ah, uh, nice. How do you stop recording? <laughs> <laughs> I heard that one today and it's suitably awful. Yes. Yeah. Very I good. like those. Uh, I like those man walks into a bar jokes. I like those, you know, the horse walks into a bar. The bar says, a long face. Face. Yes. Yes. <laughs> a skeleton walks into a bar and says, give me a beer and a mop. Um, uh, a guy walks into a bar, his friend ducked, uh, a termite walks into a bar and says, where's the bartender? <laughs> so good. <laughs> yes. You're horrible. Both of you. Um, Joe, should you ever want to hear those all day, every day, bigger pockets is hiring. Go to biggerpockets.com slash jobs to see all the open jobs that we have right now. Pinch me. 
I know. You could sit between Scott and Craig, who just sit there and back and forth like a thousand times. And I think Connor's getting into it too now, so I'm surrounded. But enough about me, Joe. Let's talk about you. Where can people find out more about you? Well, uh, thanks for having me, guys. And you find me at Stacky Benjamins. Different than your show, where you dive deep into topics, uh, you guys know that ours our show is meant to be a conversation starter. It's meant to be very light. We want to introduce you to seven or eight different concepts. We want to make it really approachable. The, the goal of the show, I was mowing my lawn when I was listening to Car Talk. And for those people who don't know Car Talk, it's these two guys click and clack. One of them died just a, about a year and a half ago, but they still play Car Talk episodes um, because they were so good. And you don't learn anything about a car. So Stacky Benjamins is not designed around you learning anything. It's meant to be that conversation starter piece and introduce you to people and concepts. And if you want more, then you go from there. So uh, we're three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And um, that's what we do. But, but Mindy... We are bringing the show live to three cities because a lot of the bad jokes we do on our show with my mom's neighbor, Doug, and my partner, OG, and I, um, and mom, we uh, we can't do a lot of them. You know, there's some visual stuff we want to do. And so and we've been told that because our our show kind of has a late night talk show kind of format. Like it would be really fun to do live. So we spent a lot of time choreographing it in the next six weeks. We're taking the show as long as the, 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 the minivan makes it there. <laughs> we're, we're, we're coming to three cities. We're coming to comedy clubs around the U S and I'm excited about that. We're actually playing the improv. I never said that I, I never thought that I'd be able to say that I'm playing the improv, but we are going to be playing the improv in uh, a couple different cities. Well, that's oh, oh. awesome. I've listened to your show and I never thought you'd play the improv either. <laughs> one thing we never talked about though is where you live right that's a huge component in you saving a lot of money right you living in your mom's basement in the mom's basement absolutely yeah. but but the basement <laughs> is moving right now i'm actually uh uh because we're moving the basement to mom's moving to detroit so uh, in january because that's when you move to detroit but i don't know if you know this the best time yes january what, what could possibly go wrong nothing so, in January, we're moving there. So right now, we are uh, saving money, Scott, by being in my friend's dad's uh, three-room apartment over his garage. So I'm looking at my friend's dad's house right next door to me. <laughs> and I'm sorry, <laughs> what is this suite called? Oh, yeah, we call it the Cato Kalen suite. <laughs> Because he lives in this huge house. Well, big enough to have a, a, a apartment over the garage. Let's put it that way. So, but we're saving tons of money. Yeah. Rent yeah. is fantastic in a three, three room. And by the way, realizing that you don't need very much live in, live in a 400 square foot place. And, and you learn very quickly that you don't need much. Uh, and, and, I love it. And if you record podcasts there, you redefine the concept of studio apartment. I know. right? <laughs> but I'm full. Big. But I'm bummed. Fire. Sorry, I, uh, I'm getting going now. <laughs> I'm gonna set him on fire. <laughs> he is totally on fire. Let me okay. tell you what's coming. So uh uh September twenty fifth will be in Orlando at the improv. So people are coming to FinCon. It's gonna be the day before FinCon. So I hope people join us there. If you're in Orlando already, come join us. We're gonna be talking to like our show, we have a bunch of different segments. I think there's fifteen different people on that show. Uh uh two weeks later we'll be in Kansas City. There's a big fintech convention going on. We'll be at the improv in Kansas City on October 9th. And then October 24th, we'll be in fabulous Ferndale, Michigan, which is just north of Detroit. And uh, we will be at a club called the Go Improv Comedy Theater in fabulous Ferndale, Ferndale Michigan. So uh, tickets are 10 bucks, and it's at stackybedjamins.com forward slash tour to find out more. Awesome. Joe Stacking Benjamins is the name of the podcast. Stackingbenjamins.com is the website. Stacking Benjamins is the Facebook group. Stacking Benjamins, uh, our closed Facebook group, yeah, is uh, the basement. Uh, Stacking Benjamins basement. Okay. So, 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 so come, come join the basement. Yes. Yeah, Stacking Benjamins, the car talk of financial podcasting. You will find a lot of bad jokes there. Uh, and it's funny when we get new people in that don't know the show in, in our Facebook group, 
because I remember we were talking about OG. Oh, my co-host was talking about like having his kids sit in random seats on a plane and then uh, going up to the people that he sat them next to and telling them t- that that they were horrible parents and they need to make their kids mind. And it was just <laughs> this, it was this really dumb joke. And this guy goes, why is this appropriate in a financial forum? <laughs> And I immediately wrote, wow, everybody, the new guy thinks this is a financial forum. (laughs) 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 High five. Like, it's fantastic. (laughs) Welcome to the basement where where we have uh, a kinder, gentler kind of fun approach to the money topics. I listen to you as I clean out my garage. My husband really, really, really likes to clean out the garage. So that's when we stock up on our stacking Benjamins. That's perfect. Perfect time. <laughs> That's what I save it for, too. That's what we hope for. If we can make a show that'll be the best garage cleaning show, that, that that's what we want. All right, Joe, thank you so much for taking time out of your basement cleaning and garage cleaning days to talk to us. I really Thanks. appreciate it. And I will see you in just a couple of weeks at the end time. Amen. Thanks for having me, guys. This has been a blast. Thanks for coming yeah, on. Yeah, thanks for coming on. This is awesome. Okay, bye-bye. Okay. That was fantastic. I love listening to Joe. I can't believe we went so long, except I can because he can talk, I can talk, you can talk. You get three talkers together and it's going to be for a really long show. Yeah, about our favorite subject. So something yeah. that we're very, all three of us very passionate about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it's not a surprise that it went so long. Um, Scott, what was your favorite part of the show? Well, I, I really liked the challenges to the the fire movement in general. You know, I I consider us and our our show and our philosophy to be part of that fire movement. But at the same time, we kind of are a little bit, you know, we're very open minded to different approaches that that don't fit into that barrel. And Joe has clearly, you know, got some reservations and some challenges to the traditional can it be traditional if fire is only like a couple, you know, not, not that, not been around and widespread that long, but yeah, he's got a couple of good, really good challenges to that kind of stuff. And I, I could talk about that all day. I think there's definitely, there is no one right way to do things. And anytime that you get, everyone begins coalescing behind these certain philosophies, I think there's going to, there's trouble brewing. There is. And I do want to do some more research into this 4% rule. Um, that he threw out a name, Wade Fow. I have to look into that a little bit more and see what Wade has to say about it. I did a lot of research into the 4% rule. Um, I can see how somebody would have questions about it. I'm assuming that this Wade cat is a smart guy who's, you know, studied finance. It's not just some schmuck on the street saying, well, that'll never work. I mean, if Joe is quoting him, I'm assuming that's that's something worth reading. Uh, because I have based a large portion of my retirement and my my financial independence on the 4% rule. So I am glad that he brought that up. And I did like that part of the show because, you know, it's really easy to find people who are super excited about fire. And it's really easy to find people who are negative Nancy's who want nothing to do with it. But it isn't all that difficult or it isn't all that easy to find somebody who is super excited about it and also wants to make sure that everybody's doing it right. You know, hey, wait, let's make sure this all works. So, yeah. And, and, and what about Joe is he's not even really trying to say, hey, everybody needs to do it right. It's everybody needs to have a clear understanding and background and the capacity to manage their money for themselves with a high probability of success. Because right? there is, hey, literally your portfolio could be best managed through your livestock port. Like that could be the biggest part of your portfolio. And that's a good financial plan for someone in a specific set of circumstances. Yours are going to be something, some, some distribution that's different than the norm. Uh, if you, if you apply yourself to study it and are honest with yourself and building your portfolio in a way that maximizes your strengths. Yep. And, you know, again, tagging off of that 4% rule, you know, caution is his, his, uh, advice to be flexible. There's so much rigidity, I feel, in the financial independence community. Oh, you have to do this. You don't. You need to make a plan and have some solid reasoning behind why you're, go- you're zagging when everybody is zigging, but you be flexible in your plan because life throws a lot of curveballs at you. Yeah, and and one more one more point on that 4% rule, which I hashed out earlier in the show, but I want to come back to again, is that 
regardless of whether, you know, one study says it works, another study might say it doesn't work, there could be all these different flaws in it, whatever, you know, it's again, I, it seems like it's a reasonably high probability way to go about it. But at the end of the day, what I see in the community, uh, and again, this is limited perspective from a poll and talking with people though, is that it's just not, whatever it is, it's not enough for people to mentally rely on as their total hurdle. People just aren't leaving their jobs, retiring, and having wealth nowhere else but in index funds and a stock portfolio and living off the 4% rule. I'm just not coming across that uh, at scale. There's a couple of individuals that, I, that I, I see that, but just for the majority of people in our community, it does not seem to be enough on its own to, to keep people happy. Well, not only is it not enough to keep people happy, but people aren't people who have gotten to that point aren't going to be happy just sitting back and resting on their laurels or resting on their 4% bank account or whatever. They're going to continue doing work. They're going to continue doing things that generates at least some income has Absolutely. been my experience. So, you know, the 4% rule is a really great goal. And, you know, I quote Joel from FI 180 all the time. What's the worst thing that could happen? If I go by the 4% rule, I run out of money. What's the worst that can happen? I go back and get a job. My worst case scenario is everybody else's everyday life. I think that a lot of people use the 4% rule as an excuse like, oh, that'll never last. I'm just not going to do it. Well, okay. Enjoy work until you're 90. You know, it doesn't have to be this, this like what excuse try it see if it works if it doesn't work pivot absolutely okay scott this ran like 17 hours we should get out of here do you have anything Listen. else you'd like to say before we go nope just that i love our new exit i love our new exit too this is mindy jensen and scott trench and this episode is over seriously turn it off it's over we're done goodbye <laughs>